I want to take you back to the very beginnings of behavioral economics. And we're in Paris in the spring of 1952 at a conference uh, which is held uh, amongst a group of economists. And rather unexpectedly, the highlight of that conference is its dinner, perhaps not unexpectedly since it was in Paris. And uh, there was a key dinner table discussion at that conference. And here are the guests at that dinner table discussion. You'll see uh, on one side of the table, there are three Europeans. There's a Frenchman called Maurice Soleil, an Italian Bruno Di Finetti, and a Norwegian Ragnar Frisch. And sitting opposite them are three Americans, called Jimmy Savage, Paul Samuelson, Milton Friedman. It's quite a distinguished guest list, because four of the six people in that room are going to win Nobel Prizes in economics later in their career. The, three American, uh, the two of the Americans, Samuelson and Friedman, and two of the Europeans, Allais and Frisch. And the reason they are having this discussion is that in the late 1940s, Samuelson had laid down concepts of economic rationality as they relate to consumer behavior, and Friedman and Savage had laid down concepts of rationality in human behavior as they relate to uncertainty. And that is what the conference was there to discuss, and that was what was the subject of conversation over dinner. Uh, we've tried, we don't have records of the menu for that particular occasion, but still we've done our best to reconstruct the actual dinner party as it went. Uh, you'll see rather vulgarly, I've put the prices on the menu. The reason for doing that is not that I think that was done at the conference. It's to give you some idea of the significance of the monetary sums, which you're going to see in a moment. So that uh, over the entree, Maurice Soleil, the French professor, said I'll list you for the dinner table to consider. And what Alay asked was, would you prefer to have an 11% probability of winning 100 million uh, French francs or a 10% probability of winning 500 million French francs? You'll see what a French franc is worth from, you'll get an idea of what a French franc was worth at the time. A 500 million French francs isn't quite as much as it sounds, but it's still a very serious amount of money. Now let me ask you in the audience what you would do. Would you rather have the first option or the second option? How many would go for one? Show of hands. How many would go for two? That's uh, a significant majority in favor of the 500 million French francs, which was indeed what happened over the entree. Then we, the next course was served. And during the next course, Allais presented a slightly different problem. It was this one. Would you prefer a straight out gift of 100 million French francs, or would you prefer to enter the lottery that follows it? In it, there's an 89% probability of 100 million French francs, a 10% probability of 500 million, or a 1% probability of nothing at all. Remember, these are very substantial amounts. Well, let's try this on this audience. How many of you would go for the surefire 100 million French francs? And how many of you would go for the lottery? Again, it's the 100 million French francs on this occasion that had it, has it. And that is what the dinner party guests around the table agreed they would do. So then dessert was served. And over dessert, uh, Allais explained that these two lotteries were essentially exactly the same. The only difference between them 
was that between the entree and the main course, he had added an 89% probability of winning 100 million French francs. So if you observe the postulates which Friedman and Savage had put forward in their, in their famous paper four years earlier, if you observe these postulates, you could not make the choices which uh, the dinner party guests had, had made. Well, you can see that prompted discussion over coffee. Uh, and it was an inconclusive discussion because the guests agreed, first of all, that they wanted to stick with their particular choices. And secondly, uh, they agreed, uh, uh, and, and they also agreed, that they couldn't really reconcile these choices with the postulates for rational uh, people under uncertainty. And Allais concluded at the end of it, the experimental observation of men who are considered rational by public opinion, and it's rather difficult to say that a group consisting of four Nobel Prize winners in economics and two other famous economists that that group didn't contain men who were considered rational by public opinion. Perhaps some of you have a different view of economists, but that's a common view. Uh, invalidates Bernoulli's principle. Of course, Allais was being very polite when he said that. He wasn't really blaming Bernoulli, who had died two or three centuries earlier. He was blaming Friedman and Savage because of the Friedman and Savage axioms that were being violated. The outcome of that, actually, was quite strange. In the following year, 1953, and this might mark the foundation of, beha of, of behavioral economics, an article by Allay was published in Econometrica, which is one of the leading economics journals. Uh, it was published in French, which is, is extraordinary. You could no, would have no hope of publishing an article in French in a major economics journal now. But it was preceded by a note uh, from Frisch, who was then the editor of... Uh, uh, Econometrica, which described the dinner party, and it said that uh, uh, the discussion had been inconclusive and the dinner party guests didn't quite know what to make of it, but they had nevertheless decided to open the debate by publishing what Allais had put forward. And Allais, in the course of that paper, had put forward a number of other similar paradoxes. That was the beginning of behavioral economics. And you should note very carefully what it says on the bottom of that slide. Well, you will when you see it. It was a quote from uh, Allais that said, the experimental observation of men who are considered rational by public opinion invalidates Bernoulli's principles. Allais was very clear that the critique which he was putting forward was not a critique of the decisions of the people at the dinner party. It was a critique of that concept of rational behavior. That's what he's saying in that slide, and that's the way it was taken. And that is the way behavioral economics was for the first 20 years. It was indeed encapsulated in the title which Allais gave to his article, which was to say, critique of the postulates of the American school. That was his, his premise. See, economics continued, behavioral economics continued in that way over the next 20 years. Perhaps the most significant contribution in that period actually came from an American, an American called Daniel Ellsberg, who explored the subject of ambiguity aversion, which he discovered was, was rather widespread. Ellsberg later became much more famous because he was a man who joined the US Defense Department and he then leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and the Washington Post. So if you've been to see the film Post, which was an issue which was released at the end of last year, you will have seen Daniel Ellsberg, who was one of the main characters in that particular story. But the idea of behavioral economics was that rationality, in the way in which it was postulated by economists, was not in a way of getting real insights into human behavior. That was the force of Allais' critique. But then the subject was taken up, as you all know, by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky in the 1970s, and it was essentially switched round. 
so that what had begun as a critique of postulates of rationality turned into a critique of people's behavior. It's something that economists are rather familiar with. It's the idea that if people don't behave according to the model, it's the fault of the world, not the fault of the model. Allais' position was that it was the fault of the model. The new behavioral economics position from the 1970s was that it was the fault of the world. And if the world did not conform to the postulates of rationality, which Samuelson and Savage and, uh, and Friedman had put forward in the late 1940s, then people ought basically to be knocked on the head if one's being blunt about it, or nudged if one is being less polite, uh, nudged into doing the right thing. So that you can see what the new group of behavioral economics actually thought. Uh, I am less interested, first he said, in artificial intelligence than I am in natural stupidity. Those of you who read Michael Lewis's book or any other accounts of Tversky will know that natural stupidity was something someone like Tversky felt he encountered rather a lot of. And uh, Richard Thaler, who just received the Nobel Prize in this area, said, I spent about a fair of time listening, looking at this list of things people do that are inconsistent with the model. But I did not know what to do with it, he said. Dumb stuff people do is not a satisfactory title for uh, an academic paper. And it's not. But actually, I want to turn that crit critique back to where it was. I want to say that instead of criticizing people's behavior, we ought to criticize the model of rationality and use a wider spread of models to understand better why it is and how it is that people do what they do. And I want to make two fundamental critiques of that model of rationality as it was put forward and as it is still maintained by the majority of economists. The first is that that model is individualistic and we are not individualistic. Our intelligence that we have in this room, and this room is a sense example of it, our intelligence is essentially collective rather than individual. That is why you have come here today. I've recently been reading because I think much of the evolutionary psychology literature is relevant to our understanding all of this. But I've been reading, as well as evolutionary psychology, comparative studies of the evolution of different primates. Michael Tomasello, who has spent his lifetime studying the behavior of apes, has written, you have never seen two chimpanzees carrying a log together. And you haven't achieved in the chimpanzees even that level of cooperative activity. Humans, on the other hand, are able to build air buses. And that's extraordinary when you think about it for a moment, because no person, nobody in the world, actually knows how to build an air bus. But tens of thousands of people working together do know how to build an air bus. That's the nature of human intelligence, and it's not, found in, it's not found in any other mammal species. Some of that kind of collective uh, uh, intelligence is in a primitive way found in insects, but it's not found in any other mammal species. That's what makes us different. The second fault in this kind of model of rationality is that it is based on what S S Savage actually called small worlds. Savage went back from that conference, took the boat back across the Atlantic, and then wrote saying he'd thought about it, and he'd now concluded that he had been wrong in describing his preferences on that particular occasion. What he'd been wrong, what his mistake, uh, was actually giving a, an erroneous account of his preferences. But Sam Savage then wrote, uh, magisterial work on the foundations of statistics in which he explained that this kind of rational thinking about uncertainty applied only in what he calls small worlds. And by small worlds, he meant simple, well-defined problems in which the nature of the problem was well-defined and the answers were clear. It was problems like the ones which are set by behavioral economics. I quite like this one, which is a commonly used one. 
When you ask people to read that, you know that 90% of them read it as saying, a bird in the hand. If you look carefully, you will see, of course, it doesn't say, a bird in the hand. It says, a bird in the, the hand. But then ask yourself, is someone who asks to read that and reads it as a bird in the hand, who is actually making the mistake? The person who reads a bird in the hand or the person who wrote a bird in the, the hand in the first place? This is a slightly extreme example of what has been the foundation of a great deal of behavioral economics, which is you set people's small world problems in which there are well-defined choices, well-defined answers, and as you discover that they make mistakes. They make mistakes, in fact, because they actually live in larger worlds, in larger worlds in which we see misspelled and inaccurately written sentences, paragraphs, all the time, and which we interpret, in which we interpret them as meaning, what, uh, as meaning what the writer intended to say, rather than what the writer actually literally did say. And actually, this is so easy that even a computer can do it. If you type a bird in the, the hand uh, into Google, it doesn't pay any attention to the double the and immediately directs you to people who have said a bird in the hand. The problem, and this is so much of behavioral economics, people have set artificial problems with well-defined uh, solutions and clear answers, and they find that people make mistakes in answering these. But actually, we weren't adapted. We didn't evolve to do Sudoku problems. In fact, the reason people find Sudoku problems interesting, I don't, but some people apparently do, the reason people find Sudoku problems interesting is that they are actually difficult for ordinary people, and they're easy for computers. But we didn't evolve to be like computers. And if we had, it had been useful for humans to be computers, we would have been much more like computers in the way we think than we actually are. So what I'm arguing is that actually we need to look less to these economic postulates of rationality and rather more to evolutionary psychology to understand why it is that we behave as we do. And let me illustrate with two standard so-called biases which emerge from the, uh, the behavioral economics literature. The first is a problem which was posed by Samuelson at that, uh, uh, at that dinner party, and it runs like this. Uh, would you agree to pay 50 pounds uh, for a 50% chance on a flip of a coin that you will win 100 pounds? Well, how many people would do that. How many people would bet, pay me 50 pounds for a 50% chance of winning 100? Take a vote. Incredibly few, three or four in the whole audience. Let's take the second bet. Suppose I agree to play this game 100 times with you. And I've done the maths for you just in case um, you're not quick enough at doing it or you don't have your, uh, your, your laptop to hand, even though I gather Sky has currently brought it back. Uh, but I can assure you that if you play this game 100 times, on average you will win 5,000 pounds, and the, but the probability that you will lose anything at all uh, is less than 1 in 10,000. How many of you would play that game? Almost everyone. And of course Samuelson knew that, but he nevertheless went on to explain that if you accorded with the Friedman Savage postulates, you would be perfectly willing to accept the first if you're also willing to accept the second. You are, in terms of this underlying model, irrational if you, uh, uh, if you do that. And when you, do, when you make these choices, you're suffering from, I think there's a group down there who are on the table, ambiguity aversion. Where are you, the ambiguity aversion group? Over there, and there's another group who are negativity bias. Over there? Right, well, we've now, I think, I hope, got a slightly better understanding of negativity bias and ambiguity version. We didn't evolve to do these kind of optimizing calculations. We evolved in order to survive. 
And it's not really very surprising that people who evolved in order to survive have a degree of loss aversion. Now, I think there's another group at a table who have optimism bias. Where are the optimism bias? Right at the back there. Well, let's look at opt optimism bias. I always like a story which Jim Collins, business guru, called the Stockdale Paradox. And Stockdale was actually a US uh, aviator who was shot down in prison during the Vietnam War. And Stockdale spent five or six years in a North Vietnamese prison before he was being released. And what Stockdale said at the end is, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life. But then he said, who were the people who didn't make it out of these Vietnamese prisons? The optimists, he said. The ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and go, and then it would be Thanksgiving, and it would be Christmas again. These are the people who died in that terrible Vietnamese captivity. Optimism is actually a pretty useful trait to have. And let me uh, emphasize that by giving you, I know you always like takeaways from this kind of event. I'll give you, as one should, uh, two buzzwords for your colleagues. One is collective intelligence, that the idea that we are far more intelligent as a group than we are as individuals. And the other is communicative rationality, that we shouldn't confuse the reasons we have for explaining what we do with the reasons we have for doing it in the first place. These are not necessarily the same thing, and once you've learned to distinguish between these two, that makes a difference to the way you think about rationality. But I want to leave you two epigrams to remember as well. One is to say that evolution is smarter than economists. Right? We are like we are because we have a long history which has developed us to be well adapted to our particular environment. And it's possibly not surprising uh, that if one sits in one's desk and writes down a model of how people ought to behave, it doesn't describe that behavior very well. There's an economist called Eli Devons who once said, if you asked an economist to study the behavior of horses, he would sit in his room and with a bit of paper and ask, now what would I do if I were a horse? And that's not actually a bad observation. But the second uh, 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 I think court I'd like to leave with you is to rotate you back to that dinner party with which I began and ask, would you really have enjoyed an evening in Paris with these particular six uh, people around the table. Uh, would you have welcomed the discussion over dessert or the postulates of rationality? Or would you rather have been somewhere more interesting? There's a lot to be said for optimism, and there's a lot to be said against economic rationality. Perhaps rational economic man dies out because no one wants to mate with him. Thank you very much. <laughs>